Okay, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Phil Speed, and I'm from a company called Quantum Base. So as the slide says, this is who I am, this is where I write, and this is where I speak. And today, I'd like to share with you some insights into the new, exciting, and incredible world of quantum security. So this is fundamentally 100% bulletproof security. And I understand you may not believe me on that, but you're gonna have to trust me for a few moments. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about what we do, how we do it, and who we are. And the it in this case, as I say, is quantum security. It's the only way to deliver 100% provable security guaranteed by the laws of physics. So we're talking about fundamentally secure solutions as opposed to hard-to-break puzzles or mathematical complexity. This is the start of a really interesting and exciting journey. So please bear with me over the next few minutes and I'll try and share some of that with you. Okay, we believe that quantum technologies are about to enter a key moment of inflection or market transition. And we believe that this is the very tip of a very large iceberg. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about the next five years, but this is something that will proliferate into the consumer, enterprise, and service provider space over the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's the start of a quantum revolution. And we think it'll be every bit as significant and the ramifications of which will be every bit as significant as the microprocessor was all those years ago. So having set the scene, why should you believe me? Well, the greatest scientists in the world do. As you can see, we have a very prestigious Royal Society Fellowship. We also re receive support from GCHQ, EPSRC, the US Air Force, and we have a strategic relationship with the Graphene Centre in Manchester, God's own city. Sorry, I always got to plug that. We're world-leading scientists at a world-leading institution. And I'd like to share with you some of our world-first inventions um, that we've done historically, and that should give you a flavour of the demonstrable track record and the proven ability that we have to deliver world's firsts, and then I'll come on to talk to you about what we're doing today and what we're going to do in the future. So we'll see if this pointer works. First one on the top right was the world's first LED to emit entangled photons. So prior to that, you needed a lab full of equipment. So this was the world's first simple LED to emit entangled photons. But that was only one in a thousand. So then we had to solve the yield problem. Top right, each apex of each pyramid contains a quantum dot emitting quantum light. So that was the yield um, problem solved. Bottom left, we were the, guys, the first guys in the world to deliver quantum and classical information over an existing fiber to the home network. So in essence, we smuddled the, the quantum information in the zeros. I know I'm oversimplifying it, but you get the drift. And then finally, bottom right, was the world's first room temperature operation of a quantum light device. Prior to that, everything was done at low temperature because it's easy to manipulate the atoms at low temperature, but clearly in the real world, you've got to operate at room temperature. So those are all world's firsts. Those are what we've done. And what I'm going to try and talk to you about over the next few minutes is what we're doing today and what that means in terms of the future. So we're also published in Nature. As I say, we've got a Royal Society grant. And what that means is it's the highest global third-party advocacy possible. So I know I'm sounding like a bit of a show-off, but they told me to tell you the truth, so. Okay. This slide nicely summarises our strategic vision. And like all great slides, I've stolen it from somebody else. So we talk about short-term, smarter maths, uh, sorry, short-term, longer keys, medium-term, smarter maths, long-term, provably secure, end-to-end -end quantum networks. Now, the rest of the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the short-term and that's about longer keys. But it's not just about longer keys. It's about when you start from scratch, create it 
in a more interesting and a smarter fashion. So it's certainly longer keys, but it's the least amount of resources possible. It's the highest bit density and it's the best integration potential. And all of that, which I'll come on to talk to you about, are world's firsts. The medium term, for those of you that are not aware, the, there's some stuff going around in the press at the moment, and this talks about post-quantum computers. And, and the basic premise is that once a quantum computer arrives, it rips through encryption overnight. So in terms of the medium solution, we're talking about smart, smarter maths that are either quantum resistant algorithms or algorithms that are not known to have any, should we say, backdoors or flaws currently. And then in the long term, we talk about transitioning to provably secure end-to-end -end quantum secure networks. Okay, so these are here today and these are world's firsts. You'll hear me interchange two words or two phrases to confuse myself and hopefully not you guys. So these are QIDs, quantum identities, or you may hear me refer to them as quantum puffs, and that stands for physically unclonable function. So QID and QPuff is exactly the same thing. I just tend to interchange the words sometimes. So we have two worlds first here. There's an electronic device whereby you put current through to stimulate a response, and there's an optical device whereby you put light through to simulate a response. So the optical version, you can read with a smartphone and a cheap filter. And the electronic version, as I say, you need current through. So let me tell you a little bit about them, because these devices are here, and they're both world's firsts. OK, so this is the electronic version. And we're not going to do quantum physics today, and especially not as I'm the last speaker. But just to give you an idea of how it works, and we have some quantum physicists here today, so if anybody really wants to get into the weeds, we can do that later. But I don't propose to go through any quantum physics today. In simple terms, it's the arrangement of atoms that gives its unique identity. So we do some funky quantum mechanics in a device, but the arrangement of the atoms is how you get your unique identity. And obviously, these are very, 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 very small devices. So a thousandth of a human hair, you put some current through them, and depending on the atomic arrangement, will give you a unique ID. So each ID is different. There are no two devices the same, and they're all 100% secure. And I'll come on to talk to you about that in a little bit of detail. So a good way to think about these and I get heavily criticised by quantum physicists for using this analogy, but it kind of works for me. Try it on for size and see what you guys think. Imagine if I'm here today and I tip a wheelbarrow of sand on the stage and then I do that a second time. The arrangement of the sand will never be the same as many times as we do that. And not only will it never be the same, we then can't rearrange the sand to make them look the same because that processing power just does not exist today. So as I say, it's the unique arrangement of atoms that give a unique readout. And that unique readout is a signature that is different in every device. It's easy to read, and that creates the unique identity or the digital signal. Mm, technology might have broke. There we go. So as I say, these are tiny devices. They're a thousandth of a human hair in size. The reference there is published in Nature. So we published in Nature. So this, this has been patent pending for 30 months, the electronic device. And we published in Nature in about November of last year. So tiny devices that create a unique identity based on the atomic arrangement of atoms. And what's most important then for the purposes of today, you can't copy, clone, or simulate these devices. So this is the biggest gap between the good guys and the bad guys that it's possible to build. And this is due to the quantum nature and the quantum revolution that I spoke about earlier. And not only can you not copy, clone, or simulate these devices, they're the smallest in terms of size, weight, and power. Now, that's really important if you think about things like um, Internet of Things, IoT devices. So the profile of an IT, IoT device is small footprint, low bandwidth, small power. These are ideal because of the, the lowest size, weight, and power possible that you can build uh, for that kind of solution. You can produce them en masse. I was going to say they're as cheap as chips, but I kind of bought some chips the other day, and they were really quite expensive, so these are a lot cheaper than chips. You're talking pennies for these kind of solutions. And as I say, the key takeaway in terms of security is that you can't copy, clone, or simulate these devices. 
and that's due to the quantum nature and the quantum phenomena that happens within the device. Okay, so we're very much in product market fit stage. So we've created this really funky new secure quantum technology, but we're not kind of sure what to do with it really. And I thought you guys might help me in this regard. So we're at product market fit stage and we're looking for partners to either help us build use cases and sell the solutions or work with customers to actually create use cases. I'll give you a few ideas. And I'm I'm kind of oversimplifying it. We do have some ideas as to where we might use this. But I think you're going to be as expert as me in this regard. So we think, obviously, you could use them for anything that receives current. So that could be a laptop, it could be a mobile phone, it could be a SIM card, it could be a computer, it could be networking equipment, it could be an IoT device, it could be a smart card, it could be a credit card, it could be an access card. We think maybe even use it with blockchain as an identity in the blockchain. Um, so there are a lot of very different use cases there. I'm around, all the, my name's Phil Speed and I'm here all day. I'm around for a, a while afterwards. So if you want to talk about it, if you want any suggestions, if you want to talk about partnering, I'd be very interested to have those discussions. Um, the website's quantumbase.com, so feel free to, to either write to me at speed at quantumbase or there's a form on the website, quantumbase.com, and you can actually you know, be happy to have a conversation with you. So that's the electronic version. I want to talk to you about the optical version. So as I say, the optical version, you can read with a smartphone and cheap filter, which means that anybody, anywhere, can actually check authenticity or manage supply chain. The way this works is similar to the electronic version in as much as it's the unique arrangement of, of the atoms and the imperfections in the atoms of two-dimensional materials. So these are things like graphene-like substances. So graphene isn't a good example because it doesn't have a band gap. Don't worry about that for today. But graphene oxide, MOS2, and a variety of other graphene-like substances, two-dimensional materials, are what we use to read the optical device. So as I say, you, you put light, a standard CCD camera, and a cheap filter through the device in order to stimulate a response. And it's the unique arrangement of the imperfections within the atoms that give it its unique identity. So again, these are tiny devices, thousandth of a human hair. Right-hand side gives you an idea of what one of these looks like blown up under an electron microscope. And I think you can get the general idea that it's the unique arrangement of the imperfections that give it its identity. And just to give you an idea of cost, on the left-hand side is a vial of graphene oxide. Now, that particular vial costs about 10 quid and would cover a football field. So as you can see, not only are there unique identities that you can't copy, clone, or simulate, it's actually cheap as well. Mass manufacturing, um, and therefore we think we can address many volume-driven markets. So as I say, you can't copy, clone, or simulate these devices. You can read them with a smartphone and cheap filter. They can be deployed overtly or covertly, depending on how the customer wants to use them, because you can't actually see them with the, uh, the naked eye. And each tag has its own unique identity. Now, this is probably quite important. I should probably stress this point. Because it has its unique identity, every device is capable of being addressed via the internet or new media technologies. Now, that means a few things. It means that the marketeers in the room can actually sell to these devices or the products that they're on and the customers for the first time. They can create communities of interest, um, merchandise, sell them. I think another interesting feature is that you can turn them on and off anywhere in the supply chain. So if they're stolen, if there's a recall on a product, for example, all of which can be done in real time using a database remotely. And as you scan them, you get the information. So this product is stolen. This product is authentic. There's a recall on this product. And again, because of the unique nature of the product and the unique identities, this kind of functionality you're able to use for the first time. I think probably another thing to say is you can actually give it the bad guys and they can't do anything with it. Because you're dealing with a number of atoms, you could actually give, give the device to the bad guys and they can't do anything with it because that technology is just not available to clone that today. These devices, and this is generally the feel or the nature of quantum, straddle multiple traditional stratifications. So I'll give you a few examples just to show you where you might use it. But they have properties... That, that coexist across multiple current technologies. So you could, oops, wrong button. 
you could use it to replace holograms. So why would you do that? Well, these are 100% secure. Most holograms aren't. They're cheaper than holograms. Each one has a unique identity, and therefore, as I say, you can mark it to them. You can turn them off and on anywhere in supply chain. You can do simple track and trace with them. So you could do uh, simple track and trace for a couple of pennies rather than tens of pounds with RFID. You may put them with RFID to make secure RFID. You may put them with holograms to make secure holograms. But in all cases, you don't need scientists, you don't need labs, you don't need expensive proprietary equipment in order to test them. It's a ubiquitous technology that everybody on the planet, assuming they've got a smartphone, um, can actually check the authenticity of the product or track throughout the supply chain. We also think they're going to be food safe. So these, these things are fundamentally very, very, very small pieces of carbon. So at a scientific level, there's no problem in terms of eating them. Perhaps there's a better way to say that. So sports apparel, you can maybe use them. You can maybe use them anywhere in supply chain, automotive, aerospace. The electronic version, anything that re receives current. So that could be mobile phones, networking equipment, SIM cards, access control cards, computer games consoles. So as I say, we're very much in product market fit stage. We're looking for partners to actually develop use cases with us. We're looking for customers to help us develop use cases. And we're probably going to go out for investment in the next six months. So if any of those things are of interest to you, please feel free to have a conversation with me. Thank you so much for your time and have a lovely rest of the day.